Good. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for attending the CPEP seminar this afternoon. Uh, nice to see some uh, so many faces. I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker this afternoon, uh, Carolee Dodge Francis, and she is coming to us from here at UW Madison over in the School of um, Human Ecology. So I'm going to let you present and, and start off. But thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Hello, Hello, all my relatives. Aswishina, Nehana Sutuki, a little woman, and I go by Carolee Dodge Francis. So, just to give you a little background, I am enrolled in Oneida, of Oneida Nation of Wisconsin, and however, I grew up on the Menominee Reservation. So, combination of, of two different tribal entities. So some of this work comes from a article that recently Dr. Nicole Bowman and I wrote, um, Shared Kinship Through Research and Evaluation, more about kinship, shared kinship. And I just want to give a shout out because Dr. Nicole Bowman, who also is uh, here at UW some of the time, she and I do quite a bit in regards to research and evaluation from an indigenous lens, so just want to make sure that I acknowledge that. So the presentation is really reflecting upon some of the historical contexts and how we create kinship when we're doing research and evaluation, and making sure that we're looking at it from an indigenous lens. So we'll conclude with a few areas that we might want to consider to incorporate when we do research and evaluation. And I say research and evaluation because many times they have the si very similar tenets when you're working in uh, indigenous communities. So building kinship, situating in indigenous knowledge is really foremost for researchers and evaluators. Understanding people of a place, um, so the tribes that reside within Wisconsin, or the fact that we're on Ho-Chunk land. Um, then looking at community and family, what roles does that play within your framework of research or evaluation? And then sovereignty, creating ownership, and most importantly, building capacity, not just going in and taking and then leaving. You know, how we interact and how we build, build kinship is really important within indigenous communities. Research and evaluation should be holistic and attends to relationships between activities and its context within community. Engage community while planning, not in the middle or at the end or when you get, the, get to do the results. They should be foremost in the early stages of research. Also ensuring tribal control of data is really important. If you're going to partner with tribal communities or indigenous populations, what is that partnership going to look like? Make sure that it's equal and that it is done to build, again, capacity. So oftentimes when we talk about teachings and directions, we talk about the seven directions, and most of us are probably most familiar with the four directions, north, east, south, and west. But in indigenous communities, we also look at the kinship between that is above us, which makes sense considering the building we're in, um, and that is below us, okay? So we look at also what is within us, the reflection of our indigenous cultural traditions and practices. So those are the seven directions that we usually talk about. The tribes vary in regards to how those seven directions um, might be interpreted um, because we do have different traditions and we have different cultures. But I wanted to, uh, I can't remember how many of you have read braiding, uh, braiding sweetgrass? Okay, so a couple of you. So she says, in her 2021 book, says, 
The word kinship should be seen as a verb. The action and movement of gifts among all inhabitants, not just humans, but also our plants, our animals, our insects. The exchange of these gifts that makes kinship more than ancestry or common history. In my article I, I wrote, I believe that we embody and reciprocate this ongoing interrelationship of kinship with the land and the seven generations. So one of the first um, bullets I talked about was situating indigenous knowledge. Um, these are my parents. Um, they both passed away about two years ago. Um, both in their 90s. But indigenous content really starts in the family, in the community, and connecting us to history with the ability to strengthen the bonds and the relationships for transformative practice. And that's what, as researchers and evaluators, we're looking to strive for, transformative practice. How do we make change? How do we ensure that we are um, entrusting our practices within community. So it also comes with teachings. So I would be remiss if I didn't tell a story as a traditional elder person. So you can kind of see in the very corner here this aluminum bolt right there. One of my greatest pastimes was fishing with my father on the many lakes or going fishing in the rivers. And Menominee Nation has just, you know, I used to know that number, how many lakes and streams. I do not know that number anymore, but a lot. So fishing for me was sort of my happy place. My father one day said, when I was fairly young, probably, I don't know, eight years old, and we'd go out in that boat, and it was a rowboat. Um, I don't know how many nets I lost off the oars, but it was a lot. We would go out, and then he one day said, there's more to fishing and the enjoyment that you are getting from this activity. He said, you need to think about the fact that not all fish will come home with us. You know, Some are too small, you put them back into the environment. Some might come home and will become fertilizer for our garden, which feeds us. So we didn't go to um, the grocery store very often, occasionally. We pretty much lived off the land, so our food came from hunting and fishing and gardening. He said, you need to learn, though, how to take care of the fish, you know, to make sure that you clean them properly so that you can share that. So coming full circle in an environmental way, but also sharing indigenous knowledge. So many of my teachings came from my father as it relates to environment and how I look at research and how I look at evaluation and practices. And you thought it was gonna be one of those big fishing stories, right? <laughs> so, Phenomena of power and place are very important. Um, our homelands are a strong connection to us as indigenous people. For me, going home to the Menominee Reservation is important because that, that is where my heart is, but also that is where our people are. And we want to make sure that when outsiders come in, we are accepting and welcoming, but at the same time, um, research need, researchers need to understand what that relationship and kinship means for both of us. I wanted to look at, oops, sorry. We use this model often in evaluation, but it really has tenets for research too. Um, so, Dr. Bowman is Mohegan, Lenape, and Stockbridge Muncie, and the Stockbridge Muncie Reservation is really adjacent to the Menominee Reservation. But she and I use this model a lot because it gives us some grounding and a model in which we can use not only for evaluation but also for research. 
and we look at the northern door as wisdom of our experiences used for growth and new imagining or visioning. The eastern door is really important, and that's when we talk about kinship, building relationships. Building relationships in tribal communities just doesn't happen overnight. Sometimes it takes months, sometimes it takes years to build those relationships. To do it right, let me just say, is the ability to sometimes just be in community and listen to community. I know all of you are researchers, right? Or you've done research. And you have these great ideas. And you want to just go in and, you know, you're energetic and you just want to like, okay, I can do this. Let's, let's just go in and do this research. But one of the things that I, I talk to my students about quite often is patience. Patience and listening two key factors when doing research or evaluation with indigenous populations. Because they may have their own stakeholders, gatekeepers, you need to understand what that hierarchy looks like, whom you might need to speak with first, how you might gravitate to certain uh, individuals that can help navigate indigenous communities. And, and oftentimes, some of my students will say, well, you're a native. I'm sure you can just go everywhere. And it's like, no, not exactly. I have relationships across many indigenous communities, but it doesn't mean that I can just waltz in and do my research or be the evaluator. So building relationships and sharing strengths is very important before you even start doing any type of research. The southern door affirming the value of our lived experiences. So our lived experiences may be very different than what the Western world um, thinks research, research should look like. I am first generation, um, the first generation in my family not to go to boarding school or government school. I'm the first generation in my family to go to college. So. Our lived experiences may look very differently than those that are more in the academia field. Using academia language oftentimes does not translate well with indigenous communities unless you have someone that has you know, some strong academia background. So think about the language that we use, the language and how it translates, how we interpret it and looking at the lived experiences in the context of our research. So the Western door, challenges and gaps. How do we address those challenges and gaps? Oftentimes, we may not know. I, would, I teach proposal writing for undergrads. And sometimes I have these great proposals or these great research proposals, and I say, it sounds so good on paper. I know it's going to be like you know funded and or I know it'll be just a success when I go in the field. But then there might be some challenges or hiccups that you hadn't really thought about, and how do you manage those? One of the things that I talk about is, is the capacity, building capacity. I think one of the areas that, as researchers, I find it is our charge, or it should be our charge, that we are always educating the community in which we're going into. You know, you, you don't want to go into a community and, and you don't share any of the skills or the resources or the how-to mechanisms. I think that should be, as academics and researchers, that should be our charge, that they're learning from us as much as we're learning from them. The Northern Door wisdom of our experiences is used for growth and new visioning. So. How do we both grow within a research construct or an evaluation construct so that we both receive some of those gifts from the research evaluation? So for the betterment of the population. So when you think about considerations for scientific research and evaluation, one of the sites I, I frequent often is in Alaska, 
and this was a 12th grade high school student and we were in a small village you can only get to that village by flying in and so I've done a, quite a bit of research up in Alaska but she was collecting water to check mercury and the reason she was looking at mercury levels at the water at this site is because kind of just maybe a few yards down from where she is was where they would clean um, the fish camp. The fish camp was held, and so they were cleaning the fish there, and oftentimes the fish cleaning would go into the water. So they were not only wanting to check mercury in the water, but then we also looked at mercury in some of the salmon that was collected. So one of the things about considerations for scientific research and evaluation is this, this particular student, it's typical for us in different indigenous populations, tribal communities, and especially in Alaska, is to go to that student's family to talk about what this research will entail, how answer any questions parents might have about their student being involved in research. One of the fears for quite a while, and, and it still exists, is that if students went off to college or did research, they would not come home. So ensuring that students are learning skills that are transferable back to villages and communities is very important. So it is also very acceptable practice and traditional practice that you will be invited into um, a family's home to partake of the meal. So that was the case, and her mother made um, huge, it was wonderful. We had, we had smoked salmon, and then we had uh, pan-fried salmon. But one of the things, so she wanted to check for mercury and fish. So, so what kind of obstacles, when we talk about barriers and gaps, what kind of obstacles do you think that brought up? It brings up the fact that Fish, there are fish camps and they, um, their ability to smoke, to freeze fish, is sustenance for the winter, right? So what are we doing? She wants to check mercury, so we needed samples of their fish, which means that takes fish away from the family. So thinking about some of those things, and um, you know, I worked with some other researchers and scientists to ask, how much did I actually need? Because I didn't want to take more than the family was able to provide. Because this is what keeps them going in the winter for food. So thinking about different types of barriers or gaps that might come up beforehand is important. So one of the things that we ask ourselves, and sometimes when we work jointly with non-native researchers, one of the things we often say is, you know, when we're in community, whose voices are being heard? So for me, it was important to talk to the family about, are you able to actually give us samples? How does that impact you? Will that impact you? So we want to be able to hear what they have to say. We want to think about the design and the methods. Um, because we used Alaska as one of the areas that students did research, we typically went to them. They don't have the resources to come here or come to a university. Who interprets it, interprets the data, and who gets the data? Those are important questions to think about when you're creating your research or evaluation design. <coughs> What kind of conclusions are drawn? Are they drawn just based upon your interpretation or are they drawn based upon a collaborative method? And then how are those conclusions presented or published? Are they translated in a way that actually provides some information for the tribal community? Or are they translated in a way that will get a peer review journal article? So making sure that we think about considerations for scientific research and evaluation 
is part of our thought process when we're creating design is really important. The other last part of this is based upon the data, what policy programs and initiatives will get funded that are an opportunity or will advance a tribal community. It's not just about advancing our um, publications or our career or, or our scientific findings. It's also about how does this impact the community in which we're working with. So I ask you this question, how will you be part of the solution to solve these long-standing issues that communities face when you work with indigenous populations? And I think if you think about that question, when you're starting to do research design or you're starting to interact with indigenous populations, um, that will help you as you formulate. So oftentimes we hear about community-based participatory research, CBPR. That, that's a really very familiar research term that we hear. But how many of us hear about tribally driven participatory research? Probably not as much, because CBPR is at the forefront. So I'm going to put my glasses on because my print for this one is a little smaller. So when we think about CBPR principles, some of the things that we recognize are the fact that it is for the betterment of the community values and goals. And we want strong community participation empowerment of the community, and recognition that membership and boundaries may change within the community. When we think about tribal, tribally driven participatory research, there's a difference. Tribal government are established by law and have governmental authority. Tribal governments can actually control and drive their own research without researchers from the outside, if they so choose. Tribal governments could drive their own research and invite external collaborators. Empowerment is reciprocal relationships. And also tribal governments have largely defined authorities and jurisdictions. So when you think about those two, we want to think more about tribally driven participatory research. So that we're in the planning of looking at how does the tribe benefit from that. And when you think about that, there are some steps before we even get to thinking about actually putting in place um, research activities. Indigenous ethics and protocols. Many tribes have different mechanisms, but there are always cultural and traditional requirements. Indigenous legal and multi-jurisdictional requirements. Um, if you're looking at maybe um, tribes of Australia, there might be international NPO requirements. But always there's the IRB human subjects, which starts at the university. But besides that, many of the tribes have now started to have their own IRB, institutional review boards. So there are secondary steps and when doing research with the tribes. So think about that, that yes, you can go through UW-Madison's IRB, but then what are the steps to go through for the different tribes? Do they have an IRB? Do you have to go in front of the council? Um, they might have, they might use the Indian Health Service IRB, but you need to negotiate with each tribe when you do research, when you collaborate on research. So I recently did a, we were collecting evalu evaluation data, but we still needed to go through the tribe. So regardless if it's research or evaluation, you still do the same steps, um, depending on, on that particular tribal entity. But they zoomed us into their council meeting and the chairperson was, you know, basically was asking questions. Who, who will have the data? 
How are you going to use the data? Is it anonymous? Will we get our own data? So please be aware when these actual um, invitations to present, they will ask you multiple questions. The good news was that we did have an ally within that tribe who somewhat prepped the tribal council. So knowing who the gatekeepers and stakeholders might be to assist you is very important prior to tribal council presentations. So when we look at sovereignty, which plays a very significant role in the tribes, but we look at it from a political and a scientific, scientific um, context, oftentimes we, we see the, the fact that oftentimes data, raw data, is taken out of community and manufactured in a way that does not give any kind of acknowledgement or any kind of um, note, noting back to that tribe. This isn't unlimited data or access to data for anybody to come in and just take and utilize. Um, it does belong to the tribe, and oftentimes the Diné Navajos have a very strong institutional review board. And what's interesting about their review board, so when I was when I was at University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and I had a Navajo student who was going to do research within the Diné tribe, they didn't want to hear from me as a PI. They wanted to hear from the student who was probably Diné, Navajo, but they wanted to hear the words of that student and how this research would benefit their people. So IRBs are different across tribes. And then third, external power base. Knowledge and information about a people or community located outside of the community or people of themselves. How is that information being used? Much harm has come to individuals, tribal communities, when the data has a very negative response to what's been collected as a research project. And how do you mitigate that? How do you work with that? So think, keep in mind, oh, there's a little picture of Nikki in the, in the middle there, <laughs> Dr. Bowman. Historical impacts, you know, how did we get from doctrine of discovery to where we are contemporary impacts now? Now we're, we're looking at, we're looking at how do the systems impact us? What type of systems impact us? Have things changed or have just the systems changed? So the educational systems, how, have that, how has that changed? Are we improving and making sure that indigenous people um, have a voice in the educational system? And what is that voice? How are governments and academia impacting how tribal entities actually are being successful? Or are they being successful? So think about the context in which you all do research and are you perpetuating these systems or are you helping to create new systems in which tribal communities have some benefit from? Traditional strategies, oftentimes when we think about tribal um, tribally driven community-based participatory research, we think of ways of doing it differently. How do we do it differently? Are we just going to give a survey? Um, I'm working with some of the, the committee members on the traditional, food, traditional elder food boxes for the state of Wisconsin, and looking at surveys. How do we look at those surveys? Do we need to do paper? Um, do people have internet? I mean, during COVID, it was an interesting time, but I think for many of our students in rural tribal communities, internet was, was, was not available and it was very difficult. Uh, we did a pilot 
with ninth and 10th graders, and internet was the biggest issue. Some of them joined us through their phone, but that wasn't always perfect either. So how we think about, you know, everybody does a Qualtrics and sends that out. Well, are people able to do that on their phone? Um, is it easier for them to do a paper and have someone speak to the, to the survey and ask them the questions? So thinking about strategies that might work with individuals, talking circles, uh, having, oftentimes we think of them as focus groups, but talking circles are really a traditional way in which to hear the narratives of a particular tribal population. Traditional words and foods, respectful listening, of course, oral history and data. We have a wealth of of history, archived history, um, both in, in Wisconsin, um, at the historical society, is that the right? Yes. And, but also within tribal communities. Many of our tribes have museums and have um, the history available. So thinking about traditional strategies that might be more beneficial than the typical Western way we use we use to collect data. It takes a bit more time, it takes a bit more thought, and it takes a bit more organizing. But I think in the end, it is well worth it when you're doing collaborative work with uh, a tribal community. Oops, I'm too fast again. So thinking about circular kinship, the one thing that I forgot to put on here was, we think about research, how do we develop that research? How do we de develop that in collaboration and partnership with our tribal communities? And again, start with day one. If that's where you're going to do your research, they should be at the table day one, not ask later. Um, the same with implementation. What role do some of the folks within community play in regards to implementation. And then evaluation. You want to be able to include folks with the evaluation component to any research because basically you want to say, this work, it's not always going to be transferable to another tribe. We are different. So some of the components might be transferable or you can replicate that research somewhere else. But please know you will need to start over with that particular tribal community. And then part of that evaluation, which I need to add, is really the dissemination of the whole process <coughs> and allowing the participants from tribal communities to have a voice in either the dissemination, the publications, presentations at conferences, letting them have a voice in that. So that that information and that data stays within the community, but also they take ownership of that information. Oops. Now the literature, there's a lot of literature, there's, I should say a lot, but there's more literature on indigenous research, um, looking at evaluation. Uh, we've come quite, quite a ways since since when I first went to school, there was very little in the literature about how we do evaluation, how we do research, and I think there's a new toolkit that just came out, um, came out from, for Alaska in substance abuse, so we're always looking for individuals within our communities to produce different, produce different publications, but also looking at those publications as a format and guidelines for us so that we can look and see, okay, how might this work within our community or within our research? So this is uh, just a little bit of where you might want to start. As I said earlier, the, the tenets of evaluation and research are very close. You're doing similar things. Um, Dr. Nicole Bowman and I do probably far more evaluation, but we use the same framework and foundations that we do in our research too. So this is the news article that came out that uh, Nikki and I just 
It got published in May, and uh, Kinship Pathways, um, looking at nurturing and sustaining resilient, responsible, and respected indigenous evaluators. And then Sutton King, who's also from Menominee, um, also was part of the authorship. But it is free online, open access, so that's always good. And I don't know how these will, slides will be shared or if they will be shared. So if not, contact me and I can you know, definitely send you some of the slides or some of the resources that you might be interested in ways of uh, creating and drafting your, your research <coughs> or your evaluation. So I want to say, Mackelmanen, thank you very much. Uh, here's my email and where I'm at. And I guess I can open up for questions. Is that great? The, Let's thank you early first. So and then, yes, uh, very happy to take some questions if there are any from the audience. I saw a lot of nodding heads <laughs> when I was saying certain things. So. Perhaps what resonated or what ahas did you get that you might have heard before? Okay. <laughs> See, nobody else is going to go. I think the idea of scientific colonialism, I really liked that slide where you broke it down and said, like, here's how we think about political colonialism or just colonialism in general and just make that clear leap between those things and how mm -hmm. we do that in science was just a really nice way of putting it. Um, I think that made that, it really drives the point home. So that's definitely something I've heard a lot about before, um, but I really appreciate the way that you use it. And I think it's hard because I too, as a researcher and evaluator, was trained in yeah. this academic kind of setting. So it's even though I grew up in a very much more traditional uh, cultural setting, how do you create that hybrid and how do you merge that together and have it be respectful not only of the empirical science that you're doing, but also of the population you're working through with. And that, that's really difficult at times because my, my brain sometimes get caught in you know, the more colonial scientific methods. And so you know, being respectful when I go to Alaska and saying, are you sure, you know, knowing how much fish I can take and I'm not taking like a whole fish with me. Um, knowing some of those things up front and doing some, really doing some digging and uh, making sure I'm prepared when I go into a community that may not be my own community. Yes. So if a researcher wanted to work with a tribe but was not familiar with the members of the tribe, what steps would you recommend to you know, start that process or how would they? So I think the first thing I always tell people like, do you know the tribes within your own state? Can you name them? Uh, we, I mean, thank goodness for the internet, right? I mean, you can just about Google anything. But then one of the things that you might want to do is that there's a fairly large core of Native American um, individuals on UW-Madison. And so we also have Carla Viju, who's our tribal liaison. Is that right, Annie? Is that her title? Yes. Yes. And so some of us, there's many of us on campus that are doing indigenous research and evaluation and reaching out to us and we can guide you uh, and, and give you some pointers as to how you might participate within um, a tribal community. And that's really, but really doing some background and really you know, making sure you're, you're prepared to have discussions with um, tribal communities and making sure that, oh, I just want to come in and I just want to like hang or, you know, no. Make sure you have a plan. Make sure that you have really how this will be a reciprocal relationship, not just I want to come in and I want to observe and I want to get some data collection and blah, blah, blah. That does not work or fly. 
Somebody else had their hand up. In the back? Yeah. yeah. Um, I was just going to say that I liked um, your emphasis on reaching out at the beginning and not just at the end of your, when you're about to publish, you're like, oh, maybe I should check on this. <laughs> right. So, no. Yeah. And that should be, so if you have to go in front of um, a tribal IRB or a tribal, um, a tribal meeting, uh, you need to bring that up. Because that is one of the things, sometimes they don't ask about it because it's you know not something in the foremost of their mind about you know publications. I, mean, I think we're getting better at asking about that. But that needs to be one of the talking points um, at a council meeting. You know, I do want to publish, uh, one of my Diné students had to have an agreement. She worked with, I don't know, multiple tribes across the nation, literally had an agreement that said her publication would go back to each tribe individually so that they could read it and okay it before it was actually published. <coughs> And so don't be surprised if a tribal community asks for that. And respectfully, you should have them look at it. It's their data that you just collected. And it will impact them either positively or negatively. So they do want to be able to see that. And we, we've probably gotten, I know, far more negative research press than positive research. So it impacts, and many of our tribes are small. We can't take those kind of hits. Was there another question? Did you? I guess I have like a, a more concrete version um, of a question. What, like, how do you prepare to start working on research with um, an indigenous group? Like, what are, what do you read? What questions do you ask yourself? Like, is there like a handbook? Like, yeah, that would be great. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I would like it's to do my due diligence, but really have no idea where to start. That is a really good question. Um, I think one of the ways is, is being, being part of community. If there's a particular tribal community that you're hoping to work with, starting to be part of that community, understanding that community, and of course doing research prior to, and I don't mean research, but you know, getting informational information informational background about that tribe but doing your homework about a tribe and the community there you know it could be as simple as going to one of their powwows or one of their gatherings to understand some of the traditions and culture and those are always open to the public for the most part so and then also there there are several ways you could do it on campus. So we have the student organization, Wang Chi. Wang Chi, I can't talk. <laughs> and they have events all the time. Going to, the, we just had an Indigenous Day powwow last Monday. Um, going to some of those events, and they're always advertised. Uh, getting on their email, the serve. Then there's also American Indian and Indigenous Studies program. So they have classes, a lot of classes, that they offer both semesters. So taking some classes with them, that's another good way in which to understand. Uh, we happen to have, I'll just promote our class, so we created an ethnic studies course, CSCS 330, and it is offered in the fall, but that looks at uh, historical and contemporary issues, mostly with the tribes within Wisconsin. So that's another great class to take if you're interested in learning more. But in part is self-education, but also becoming part of what the communities have to provide, which are open to the public. But very, yes, I wanted to tell Dr. Nikki Bowman, hey, we should put a handbook together. So, but we try to make sure that individuals take that first step. We can introduce you to folks, but it really is on the shoulders of the researcher to follow through and to create that kinship in those relationships. 
questions? Oh, we got one way in the back. Okay. So, I hope sometime you will give us a lecture on the concentration names. One is Wal, Wamato, Savokosha, Wopan, Milwaukee, Wawa. Mm -hmm. Yes, Matt Bobana for that comment. <laughs> so, I hope sometime you come and do give the lecture. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> So the assumption is, I think, and I think sort of the way you frame this presentation, is that when there's research um, involving, say, university scientists or, or other researchers, that, the, that it's initiated by the university person, um, you know, reaching out to a, a tribal community. But how often is it the other way around, that the tribal community sees a gap and they really would yeah. like to have some external expertise uh, applied to the topic and they reach out? That's a really good question. I think we get that more in the realm of evaluation, of evaluating some of their programs or their initiatives, and in part because funders now have pushed that there's a certain percentage of budgets that go to anybody's funded to have evaluation as a, as a key component to your proposal. Um, for example, so the tribal elder food boxes, they reached out to me, it wasn't the other way around. So oftentimes we see that more often in evaluation. I think as regards to research, not as much because many of the tribes are more focused on programmatic issues and that has that different flavor of making sure that evaluation component is covered in that. So we do get it occasionally. When we get it is when there are RFAs or RFPs that come out that include tribal communities to be part of a um, research proposal, we tend to see that a bit more and we will be asked then to be a collaborator or a partner within those proposals. But we always want them to be the lead, to be the, the ones that take the lead direction and formulating what that research design or methodology might look like. Really good set of questions. Anyone else have a question? Yes. Do you uh, see that there's ever an issue where um, the U.S. Uh, federal funding agencies push for that open access data and the tribes are uh, wanting um, internal data? Does that, do the funding agencies ever push back on that or are they respectful of that issue? Uh, I, that's a good question. So I've done some work with NIH and CDC. I know CDC is a little more uh, attuned to that, NIH, I keep, you know, they, they recognize it and, excuse me, but I think that for the issue of making sure funding can see, continues, oftentimes they give them, they don't give them raw data, they give, give them data results, which is a little different. So the raw data stays within the tribal um, sovereignty, but data results are what, you know, really drives the funding mechanism. So in order to get continued funding, you have to give some kind of report or some kind of information. But one of the things that, um, that we've been, um, Dr. Bowman and I have been talking about, and she's done, when we write articles for publications, we want to control the ownership of that, that um, indigenous knowledge rather than the publishers owning that. So that's something we, we try to negotiate every time we write an article, is keeping our intellectual property ours and that it doesn't belong to the publisher so well thank great you. well let's thank Carolee one more time thanks so much for the, the talk that was